my name is Matt Lauterbach. Um, I'm a white man in my early 40s who uses he, him pronouns. I have brown hair, a beard, and I wear glasses. Behind me is a neutral gray uh, Zoom background. I'd like to thank today's sponsor, the Chicago Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events, whose professional development provider grant made this conversation possible. And I would like to thank you for joining us today. Our team thanks Dylan Reporting Services for, for providing real-time captions for today's event. This three-hour session will include two 10-minute breaks. I truly hope that you stick around until the end, but rest assured this will be recorded. A link along with a transcript will be shared with you in a follow-up email. It's also gonna be available on the Access Reframed website. Finally, our team would like to take a moment to acknowledge the historic and current Native American communities from the Chicago region where our team is based. I'll turn to my colleague, Jason Matsumoto. Hello everybody and welcome. My name is Jason Matsumoto. I am the co-founder and director of operations at Full Spectrum Features. We are a Chicago-based 501c3 committed to driving equity into the independent film industry. I myself identify as a Japanese American. I use he, him pronouns. I am five foot three inches tall, appear East Asian, and have, a long, and have long black hair currently tied into a bun in the back. And behind me, I have a number of different types of plants, a ficus, a snake plant, and some succulents set against a white wall with thin wood paneling that, that, that stretches horizontally and vertically across the wall. As Matt mentioned, in order to bring more awareness of the history of indigenous people and their territories, and as a reminder to rethink our relationship with our city, the land, and the surrounding environment, I'd like to take a moment to read a land acknowledgement. This acknowledgement was jointly crafted with the American Indian Center of Chicago and Full Spectrum Features a few years ago. Chicago is the traditional homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Odawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi nations. Many other tribes like the Menominee, Ho-Chunk, Miami, Sac, and Fox also call this area home. Located at the intersection of several great waterways, the land nationally became a site of travel and healing for many tribes. And American Indians continue to call this area home. Chicago represents the sixth largest urban American Indian community that still practices their heritage, traditions, and care for the land of the waterways. And today, despite many changes the city has experienced, Chicago continues to be a place that calls many people from diverse backgrounds and perspectives to live and gather together. We believe that land acknowledgements are very important as a way to uplift, commemorate, and most importantly, acknowledge the existence of these communities. As part of that uplift, we'd like to highlight the Shy Nations Youth Council, whose mission is to create a supportive, open environment for Native youth, raise awareness of cultural identity, and promote a healthy lifestyle through arts, activism, and education. You can learn more about this group at the link that has been shared in the chat. I thank you very much again for being here and in continuing in the spirit of diversity, equity, inclusion, and importantly, accessibility, let's turn back to today's workshop. Matt, please take it away. Thank you, Jason. So this is Matt again, your moderator, and um, wanted to talk a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a documentary film editor who cares deeply about captioning. I'm not deaf or hard of hearing myself, but through friends, I became involved in the Real Abilities Disability Film Festival here in Chicago. Um, we hosted dozens of screenings pre-pandemic um, and all of them were open captioned uh, with panelists and filmmaker Q and A's live captioned as well. Uh, back in 2015, when we first started, to my knowledge, we were the only film festival in Chicago to screen all of our programming with captions. And then during the pandemic, 
Zoom made captioning almost ubiquitous. Um, and now there's kind of this new norm of awareness around the importance of captioning that has hopefully been set or, or is being set. Um, but for me, that awareness comes with the realization that there are many spaces where captioning still isn't common practice. So a challenge I've set for myself and a challenge I set for you as creators and programmers is, are you captioning and transcribing all of your content? Not just your centerpiece content, but all the peripheral marketing and outreach surrounding it. Um, so I'll, I'll give you one example from my own experience. Um, as an editor, I've worked on film after film where captions are created for the feature documentary, but then the trailer on the film's website goes live without captions. Um, so there are other places where captioning is falling through the cracks. And let's take a moment to think to yourself, you know, do you uh, recognize any of these situations? Do they seem familiar to you? So the DVD for your film, uh, it includes captions for the feature, but none of the special features are captioned. You held an open caption performance of a play, but none of the behind the scenes videos on your theater's website were captioned. Your live Zoom event was captioned, but those captions weren't included in the archival upload to YouTube. Let's say the videos in your museum gallery are open captioned, but there's no transcript of your audio tour. Old videos on your YouTube channel have been auto captioned by YouTube, but no one on your team has evaluated, edited, or corrected those captions. You release a podcast every month, but it's never with a transcript. You, you get the idea. There's, you know, I'm not going through this list to, to make you uncomfortable, but if, if your main content is accessible, but the marketing and outreach and peripheral media surrounding it are not, then, then your work is not truly equitable. So I don't want to go around giving the impression that we're perfect um, yet, uh, hopefully. The entire Access Reframe team were very eager to collectively commit to doing better when it comes to captions. So the goal of today's conversation is to learn from three folks who have been doing this better than we have and who have been doing it for a much longer time than we have. Um, I hope by the end of our conversation, we'll all see it as in our control to get things captioned. And um, I'd love for us all to join together in a collective commitment to ensure that nothing falls through the cracks. So I'm really excited to introduce our guests. Um, I'm gonna introduce them one at a time, meaning I'll have a brief 10 minute conversation with each person before we meet the next person. And I'm gonna ask them the same two part question, which is one, why commit to captioning? And two, what is your own process for captioning your work? So in other words, how do our guests today ensure that no media falls through their cracks, uh, whether it's their main feature or whether it's all the periphery? Um, so our first guest is Jade Bryan. Um, Jade joined our inaugural Access Reframed conversation last year with creators back in October of 2020. And she had some great things to say. I specifically remember her saying, quote, I always include captions in all of my work. So I'm excited to dive deeper with Jade into her process. So Jade, um, come on screen and, and uh, could you introduce yourself for our audience, please? I'm here. Can you guys see me? Hello, my name. I just wanted to make sure the interpreter is there. I can't see the interpreter. Okay, I'll just go ahead. My name is Jade. I am a black female. I am actually wearing a camouflage hat, uh, green with different various colors of that with NYU blazing across. Um, I have a black hoodie. And it has four, the logo, four different logos um, going down the side of it, four 
vertically. It says hashtag deaf talent. It also says that on the sleeves of the hoodie that I'm wearing. I'm wearing a watch. I have uh, four different bracelets that I'm wearing on my wrist. I use her, she pronouns. I'm a light brown skinned woman. My hair is down. It's also brown, I'm wearing earrings. Oh, and my background. There's the um, film. There's um, the film reel behind me on the wall. It's a wooden wall. And I wanted to say thank you for having me here. I'm happy to be a part of this team. And so we are here to discuss the importance of captions and make sure that people are including captions as a part of their accessibility features. I know it's been a challenge for some people and I tend to include captions in everything. You know, I'm not perfect as well. Sometimes I also miss out, but I know I can do better. And so it's really a question of time and um, resources at some point, but you have to be mindful and try to make all the content everything that you make accessible via captions. My filmmaking background is that I've been involved with filmmaking over 25 years. I'm a writer, I'm a producer, I'm a director. Um, and I love making up things. I love creating, I love creating content. Really, it's very inspiring for me. I can't imagine living my life without being creative, without that, because that's so much who I am that embodies who I am as a person. So really, I it's my pleasure to be here. So thank you for having me. Thank you for your introduction, Shade. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to learn what your own process for captioning your own work is. What, you know, how do you actually do it? What tools do you use? Um, you know, what standards do you have for captioning, et cetera? Oh yeah, sure. Um, so I remember the first time I actually entered film school and that was my real first exposure to working and experimenting with film, silent films at the time, there was no sound. And we had to add the title card to the film. I X, the IXR title that used to be the old fashioned kind where it would just zoom in on screen, would have all the information and old English script. And then it was zoomed to the activity, to the actual performances. So that was my first exposure to anything having captions. And then as I continued along, we started to use sub subtitles more. I believe, I'm trying to remember how we use them, um, what the tech, it was a Technicolor, Technicolor lab. And so we would make the film. And then once we were done, we would take a look at the script. We'd have the time code and we'd make sure that it matched up with what was being signed on screen. We would send that in, they would print it out for us. And so that was back in the day. Um, and we used probably um, Final Cut Pro for that. Um, and so it's pretty expensive, you know, it got to be kind of cost prohibitive at, after a certain point. So that was my experience back in the day with captioning as a student, especially. And so I always try to make sure that since that time that we use captions via Final Cut Pro. And I'll use an example of a film a documentary. We made the docu documentary and it was probably one of the hardest tasks that I had to do because we were filming all over. I had this great idea of people's stories that they wanted to tell. They wanted to let the world know what their stories were. And so it was related to justice, social justice issues, um, humanity, um, speaking about the issues and concerns that people face on a daily basis that they wanted to share with the world. So during the editing process, we finished with the editing, we did the sound, and then captions are always the last thing that we add. So we brought in an interpreter who was able to sit, listen to what was being spoken, type it out, do the translation for us, and then 
we had to add the voiceover at that point. So we didn't know whether to use an actor or an interpreter for the voiceover. So we just really wanted to make sure that as we were including everything, that captions were also included. And to be honest, I sat down with that interpreter that we hired. Um, and because it's from my experience that sitting down with the interpreter, making sure that we go bit by bit, that we include this, we make sure that we don't miss anything. We have to have a very detailed exact process. It's, it's a challenging process. Um, we have the recorder. Um, we have, there's so many instruments that we use. You have to go back and you have to fix something that was missed or, um, so sometimes I, you know, hire people to come in and double check even our work to make sure that we haven't missed anything in our process. Um, for this documentary film, it was very important to have that all accurate. It was a, it was a monster. And so it took so much time to be able to explain that experience to the people that we brought in. And so we had to explain the film process and the, in, the interpreting and then the captioning. So that was a monster. Um, it, it does sound complicated. And so basically it sounds like what you're saying is, um, you know, the films that, that you um, are working on, they are involving um, a lot of American sign language, uh, a dialogue, and that needs to both be captioned and voiced by an interpreter. Um, and so that's a really interesting uh, captioning challenge. Um, and I'm curious whether you tried to match the captions with the script for the voiceover or whether there were sort of different ways you know, whether they're different mediums, you know, written versus spoken uh, and how you uh, managed that. Okay, yes. Yeah. So when I was writing the script, if I'm working, for example, with a deaf actor, I write it in English. My script is in English, just, you know, standard English. And then when I'm picking my actors, once I do that casting, we have a meeting with the actors and the actors are able to do a read over of the script. And then we work on doing the interpretation from written English to signed ASL. So they use their lines, their parts, and they come up with their interpretation. And so oftentimes it's not an exact match, um, but this is what the concept is what is important. So we, we film it, the actors do their lines in ASL. Sometimes there are flubs and we have to go back and do it over if they've forgotten their line or if the script says one thing and they've kind of gone off script. Um, I always remind them to follow the script. So, you know, we'll go back and, and have the script um, manager come up. And sometimes we even create new lines and we'll stick with, we try to stick with the script, but once in a while something will come up. But post-production, we don't add the captions until post, until the end. And so when you're adding captions, even though you have the sign, which has been an interpretation of the written English, we follow the script for the, for the captions. And sometimes people are a little thrown off if they know ASL and English, because it's like, well, that's what the caption says, but this is what they signed. And it might not be word for word. We follow the script word for word. So it's very important when we have those meetings with those actors that they understand the concepts in the script. So then when it comes time to do the translation, even though it might be not be 100% matched, it's matched conceptually. And then I do have, I did have one situation that I experienced where I had to use a voiceover. Well, I guess it really just kind of depends on the story itself. So if I wanted to have my actors sign 100% all the way, sometimes they'll sign and use their voices. Sometimes they'll sign and they won't use their voices. So that's, you know, it depends on the film. It depends on the actor. Yeah, what, what I'm, oh, sorry. Um. Yeah, I was just gonna talk about another experience, but there was an experience where I, at the end, had to use a voiceover mm -hmm. and use a voice actor for the voiceover. 
I'm trying to remember what that process was like. How did I embed the captions or? Yeah, well. Yeah, I had to actually watch the captions mm -hmm. because I didn't know, you know, that voiceover didn't know sign language. So they had to depend on what the captions were and the captions came from the script. And so they didn't know as a voice actor, they didn't know what the ASL was. So they had to follow the script and we have to make sure everything just lines up properly with the music and the sound. And, you know, we actually didn't add the music at that part, um, but whatever the uh, sound room, whatever they had worked on, um, you know, they sit in and they have their headphones on and I sit there and they interpret for me what's going on and the voices are sounding like this or, um, so yeah, yeah, that was a yeah, lot. This is this is this is fascinating, and what what um, what I'm really impressed by is how captioning um, is not a one to one correspondence, and that captioning is part of uh, an act of interpretation and translation. And in the case of your films, captions are not you know uh, subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing. Captions are actually for hearing people to be able to follow the sign language. Um, and so it's it's really um, a really neat mix of of access points there. Um, so wonderful. Um, yeah, um, Jade. Yeah, I'm sure also um, that I just wanted to make sure to add that we add audio descriptions. So for example, if there's water running, we will add that. And that's for deaf people who are watching to know, oh, somebody's washing dishes or at a sink or um, there's a dog barking in the background. We add those audio descriptions or there's a door opening and closing because hearing people have access to that. The deaf won't. Or if there's a cup that's being set down on the table um, in a loud fashion, hearing people can hear that and say, oh, the door is opening. Someone's coming in the room or I can hear some footsteps coming in. They know what to expect. Whereas the deaf audience, just all of a sudden there's someone on the screen. So. I want to make sure that we're including the sound edits. We're not missing anything. We're not missing, you know, what's happening in the background that hearing people have access to. We want to offer that equal access. We want that for our deaf audiences and our hearing audiences. So there are times where we will include sound and sound can affect the voiceover. If there's music playing, there's, you know, a voiceover. It, it, sometimes it doesn't turn out right if you don't have that information. We have to be very precise. And so hearing people are able to listen to music and enjoy all of these things kind of incidentally, whereas we have to put it in on purpose. Mm -hmm. Oh, as far as the dialogue goes, if there's a dialogue between two people in a scene, my approach is that I'll add captions one on one side of this person is talking and a caption on the other side where the other person is talking. So it's not just kind of jumbled on top of each other and you don't know who's talking because it's just an ongoing running line. Mm -hmm. So I will, they are literally placed in two different portions of the screen. So you always know someone speaking on the left and someone speaking on the right and that's where it stays. And so I don't like the approach of I know the FCC mm -hmm. and Amazon, they have approach, uh, they have a, a copy of my 9-11 documentary that I created. Um, I handed that to them for their platform so that they were able to use that. And they didn't like my approach for that. They disagree with that. And so they, I was forced to follow their approach and we went back and forth. And at the end, you know, the FCC standard is such for captions that I had to adhere to that mm -hmm. for their platform. So, but you were you were really, won. yeah, you were really trying to capitalize on the the uh, potential to put you know make positioning of the captions be meaningful and help with comprehension. Absolutely. Well, wonderful. I'm I'm so excited to to uh, talk more with you, Jade. Um, uh, and for now, I'd love to meet our next panelist, um, so who's uh, Delbert Wetter. So thank you, Jade. Um, and I'm excited to learn from Delbert uh, because he provided vital feedback um, when I was creating captions for the recently released documentary for The Left Hand. Um, Del has already taught me a whole lot about captioning and access uh, for deaf filmmakers and film appreciators. So Del, um, can you introduce yourself, please? Oh, 
Hello, my name is Delbert Wetter, and I'm a white male with short hair, and it's a mix with dirty blonde and gray. I'm wearing a blue shirt, a button-up shirt, and I have blue curtains in my background, as well as a bookshelf filled with books. Would you like me to explain a bit about my background, or a little bit about my bio? That'd be great, yeah. Well, I've worked over 20 years in the entertainment industry in the film business, and I'm the co-founder of Exodus Film Group. And we're an ind independent film production company, and we have been working on mainly animated feature films. And now we are also veering into live action films, of both narrative and documentary films. And my background has been on the business side of production. I've worked under business affairs and business affairs has been my role. And so half, I also have a law, a law degree and so I've really used that to support other filmmakers and help creatives take special care of all the fun stuff like budgets, operations, contracts, and all, all of the above. So I've been increasing my responsibilities over the past few years and become an executive producer on a few films. And now I'm a full creative producer on our, our film projects. And I'm also on the board of a nonprofit organization called Respectability. And Respectability does many things, but their goal is to work with Hollywood studios and creators, producers, writers, and so on, on representation and inclusion and portrayal of people with disabilities. And I've been working with respectability to encourage more diverse representation of people with disabilities instead of having disabilities being invisible on screen. We want to see disability represented on screen to know that, that uh, a part of our lives are being represented on screen. Okay, great. Um, so Delbert, I'm, I'm very curious to, to learn your thoughts ab about that two-part question, why commit to captioning you know, for uh, creators in all realms? Um, and then what is your own process for capturing your, for captioning your work? For me, obviously it's personal. Uh, captioning is how I watch film and TV and all of the content that I watch needs to be captioned for me to experience what I'm seeing fully. And I started working with captioners way back when. Um, this is even before the streamers. And so I had TiVo and I would transfer and save all of the films and TV shows I could on my computer's hard drive so I could watch them over and over again. But part of that process, uh, captions tend to get screwed up and become sloppy with many errors. And so I had some of my favorite shows, but the captions were all uh, to having frequent errors when I would watch them. And so I taught myself how to clean up these captions. And part of the process, it was actually a really great learning experience for me to clean up these captions. And so I would actually improve on their captions as before for my own personal satisfaction. And so I, and it would improve my experience watching these TV shows and films. And so I was continued, I continued to be fascinated to how to include captions in film and TV. So with, from my company, I would personally watch all of our projects and manage the closed captioning on them. And so my first film was released in 2008. And captioning was quite an expensive process and very challenging for independent filmmakers. But of course, it's very valuable and necessary to have closed captioning. 
And so I worked with one of the top captioning groups and I ended up putting complete faith in them because they knew what they were doing. And for my second and third film, they were a bit more low budget. They were very independent films uh, with a lower budget. So we were wondering what we could do. And this was about 15 years, five, about five years later. And so we, and so we had three, uh, three play is the name of the company we worked with. And that's a captioning company called three play. And we started working with them. And there was a, it was a tremendously different experience because at that time they were part of the process. So they would have a first pass where they would use AI voice recognition for their first pass. But the interesting part is they did not rely on that for their captioning. They relied on that to identify where there was spoken dialogue and where voice was. <laughs> Sometimes if something was garbled and not understood, they used the process to identify the time codes where to add captioning. And their second pass, they would have someone personally go through the entire film and to correct all of the errors. And they used the time codes set up from the previous pass to do that. And their final pass was quality control and making sure that everything was correct. And so that process really worked uh, for us as independent filmmakers. And from my experience, I had to be more personally involved because I would catch a few mistakes and I found that they weren't exactly matching up with our script. And so I would do the final reviews myself to make sure. But really, this could cost thousands and thousands of dollars, but through 3Play, it might cost less than less than a thousand dollars working with three play. So I've been using three play as a captioning company ever since. Um, I think it's so fascinating talking both with you um, and Jade, just about the, the sort of the history of captioning. Um, you know, technology has just changed incredibly rapidly over these years. And um, it does sound like um, the process of captioning has gotten much easier. I know that um, one of our previous Access Reframed uh, moderators, um, you know, often says, you know, captioning now, you know, costs uh, pennies for the minute, um, or maybe dollars for the minute. Um, so it's gotten so much more affordable. Um, and I'm really eager to speak with you um, in our next section, Delbert, about that quality control process that you mentioned. Um, so thank you, Delbert. Um, very much looking forward to speaking both with you and Jade in our next uh, section. Um, so before we um, break, we have a third panelist to introduce you to. Um, thank you so much, Delbert. And I'd like to introduce Cheryl Green. Um, so Cheryl has been so generous in sharing with me her knowledge and expertise for several private accessibility consulting projects. Um, and I'm eager for you all to get the opportunity to learn from this tireless advocate for captioning and transcription. Um, so Cheryl, please introduce yourself. Thank you so much, Matt. It's funny, I am physically, literally tired all the time, but you're right. Every time uh, we get into a conversation about captions or audio description, I, I, I feel tireless. Yeah. So thank you so much for having me on the panel today. It's really a huge pleasure and an honor. Um, I'm Cheryl Green. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a white, invisibly disabled woman with olive complexion and long curly brown hair. I'm calling in from an extremely boring looking room with these seemingly endless off-white walls that apartments always seem to have for some reason. Um, luckily, I have a giant blue velveteen cat castle there in the background to spice it up a little. Um, maybe if we're lucky in the third section, the cat will rummage around on there. But for now, it's just me and the tan walls. Wonderful. I do some video and audio producing, uh, though I've somewhat moved away from that. Um, recently, I'm the digital operations team lead for New Day Films. And my primary work is as an access artist, 
I create captions and subtitles for film. I do audio description for film, dance films, and museum exhibitions. And I do podcast transcripts. And um, you had this question, why commit to captions? And, you know, I ask people to commit to captions and transcripts because those really are part of meeting your mission, whether you're personal mission, because you're an individual, or if you're with an organization, whatever your mission is. If you work in environmentalism, politics, run a lifestyle magazine, or a travel blog, you're not reaching as many of your constituents or your target audience as you think you are, or as you could be without these pieces of accessibility in there. I have a lot of people tell me things like, I don't do disability stuff. I do reproductive rights or whatever issue. Okay, except there are people very interested and very engaged in working in reproductive rights or whatever topic who do need captions. It's not these two separate groups, caption users on one side and then people who work on your cause on the other side. It's nonsensical. It is one group of people, humans. And in this one group, some people want or need captions, some maybe don't, and I bet there's some who don't realize yet how much they would benefit from captions if you offer them. And I want to illustrate a little bit of how, my do, how, how I do my work indirectly by telling you about some work that's done the way I don't do it. <laughs> um, because captioning, subtitling, translation, transcribing, these are all huge responsibilities. Um, YouTube's auto craptions don't cut it. You have to take responsibility and be accountable. And I have a transcription story, but everything in this story is equally true for captions. It's just that it literally happened yesterday. So I am just beside myself. <laughs> um, captions and transcripts are essentially a translation Jade gave a beautiful example of translating between languages, American Sign Language and English, or English to American Sign Language and back to English. Um, if I'm captioning somebody speaking English and typing it into the captions, there's still some level of translation in that. Captions can never 100% capture all the audio, but you do the best you can. Okay, yesterday, I was uh, listening to a friend of mine on a CBC podcast. She's a university professor. I was reading the transcript while listening. CBC is the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. This is not a homegrown shortwave radio station with one volunteer. It's a big national channel. And the transcript errors were extreme. If I had not been listening along and just reading it, I would have been pretty lost because of these typos, but I wanna share um, a little bit about how it goes a lot deeper than just countless typos, because that's the big thing you see in craptions and then most uh, transcript is typos, but it's, it's more than that. Okay, the guest is an autistic immigrant woman of color. Her English is accented differently than either of the two hosts. And by the way, they had different accents speaking in English, but hers was yet different. And they were talking about topics around disability stigma. And they asked her her first question and she gave out this huge laugh. And then the host laughed in response and the transcript didn't mention the laughter. And I'm, I'm sitting there tearing my hair out. Because the problem is if you don't see the laughter in the transcript, then this conversation looks much more serious and dour than it was. And it's a big problem because non-disabled people often think that when you talk about disability, it's serious and sad. And a lot of people assume that autistic people can't relate to non-disabled people or that they're robotic or that they have no emotions. So when this transcriber deliberately left out the laugh, it flattened this guest. She laughed so hard, I laughed out loud by myself here. And the three of them had a moment of relating to each other by laughing together. It was very social. And so the transcript makes them look separate. And then they also, in addition to just the 
extreme level of spelling and punctuation typos, they made the kind of mistakes that I recognize as a transcriber who does not know how to follow the guest's accent and that they lack cultural knowledge about the topic. And they just lack general phonetics and linguistics knowledge. When I am transcribing and captioning topic I don't know, I do a ton of research and I just, I don't pass that cost on to my client. I just eat that because great, I did research and I learned something new. It's very beneficial. The types of mistakes, I can tell the types that are typos versus the kind where the transcriber did not bother to look this topic up. Um, the same guest was in a podcast before where she said, quote, the process of disablement and the transcript said the process of disabled men, which is like, number one, not a thing. Number two, now you don't know what she's talking about. She also said the word crutch and they transcribed it as crotch. It's like, she's not talking about body parts, she's talking about disability. Like, how can it be so hard to figure out the content? You're just not trying if you make, if, if you make such a mistake. And so why not hire a better company or hire someone to copy edit it? There's this thing about releasing content that is so well-made and so highly produced and such good quality. And then the captions and the transcripts are garbage. And it's so unfair, it's very exclusionary to do that. Slapping on auto captions, auto transcript or other kind of budget work. It's, you're just, you're, you can't meet your own goals if you do that. And I think we have to think in this more united way of audience members who want and need these pieces of access, they are part of my audience. I am not going to deliberately give one group an inferior version of the product. And um, because if you don't, even though you're a nice person and a good person, there are these ableist and oddest consequences that you didn't intend. So that's why you commit. Um, yeah. In terms of my process, I think I use the same software that companies like 3 Play Media use. I use the Pro software. It's much faster. Jade was describing using Final Cut Pro. Um, the software I have is dedicated, so it's much faster and slicker to use. So I really like that. Um, I don't, I generally don't use AI, especially because I transcribe a lot of content made by disabled people. So say people with voice disability, uh, voice disabilities, speech disabilities. I worked on a documentary with none of the people, everybody had had their voice box removed in the documentary. So AI couldn't handle um, that, that level of difference in the way speech comes out. So I, I often transcribe without AI, but I sometimes transcribe with AI. But when it comes to the captioning portion, I don't ever use AI. I have my human eyes and hands on every single line, every single sentence, and do the quality control checks that Delbert um, said are so important because they are. I send a draft to the filmmaker. Won't you review this? Let me know. Did I capture the sound of the music correctly? Did I capture the dialogue correctly? And that's part of the process. Right. So I will pause there yeah. and breathe. Wonderful. Yeah, it, it really sounds like a, a theme is emerging from talking with all three of you of, about quality control and they're needing it to not be, you know, an, an afterthought um, that is just handled by some third party rapid turnaround um, organization, but more intimate involvement of the filmmaker in reviewing the captions, research on the part of the captioner to make sure they're getting all the cultural references and spellings and all of that. Um, you know, it, simply checking with the filmmaker would have solved the crutch versus crotch issue. Um, so wonderful. Well, thank you for uh, introducing yourself and your process and your reasons for why you feel captioning is so important. Um, I know that um, we, uh, we are approaching our first break of this afternoon. And so what I invite you to do over these next few minutes, we're gonna reconvene at the top of the hour. Um, 
please, you know, visit the restroom stretch, just get away from your computer screen, drop any questions you might have into the Q and A. Um, but um, when you're breaking, I, I have an optional uh, challenge for you. I want you to think about any existing content that you're responsible for at your organization that needs captions. Um, so maybe it's a trailer for your film, maybe it's a video post to Facebook, um, maybe it's an archived recording of a panel discussion, um, you know, whatever it is, take some time during these next few minutes, next six, seven minutes, um, and actually gather that URL together, um, get it up on screen on your computer. Um, and in fact, you know, collect more than one. Um, then what I want you to do is keep those handy um, for something that I'll be introducing later in today's um, conversation, um, the caption challenge that we're gonna offer. Um, so um, Sydney, if you could share that screen, great. Um, so while you're breaking, collect those URLs. I really want you to think about, okay, what am I involved in that needs captions that just fell off our radar, that slipped through the cracks? And we'll be talking at the end of today's uh, workshop about an opportunity to actually get compensated for captioning that content. Um, I also um, am gonna drop a Google Doc into the chat with terms, definitions, and helpful captioning resources. Um, so feel free to explore those. And we will see you back here at 2 p.m. Central um, or at the top of your own time zone hour. Um, so thank you very much. We'll see you back here soon. Okay. Welcome back. All right. Um, the next part of our program will be an in-depth. Oh, um, Jade. I see Jade. Yeah. Jade, saying, "Am I back on right now or no?" Oh, <laughs> you'll you'll be back on uh, right when I introduce you again, Jade. <laughs> okay. Um, so the next part of our program will be an in-depth conversation with Jade Brian and Delbert Wetter. Um, come on back on screen, uh, about what they want and need both as creators and consumers of captioned content. So welcome back, Jade and Dell. You can come on screen. Hi, Dell. Hi, Jade. Hi. Um, so I I'm, I'm, want to pose some questions for both of you. Um, and whoever would like to answer first, um, you please announce yourself. Um, so my first question for both of you is as deaf filmmakers, um, thinking about that quality control theme that emerged from last hour, um, what are the elements of quality captioning that you strive for in your own work? Um, whoever wants to, to go first. Jada saying, no, you can go ahead, Del. <laughs> Captioning quality is extremely important. I really want to know what the speaker says. When there's words that are dropped out or missing or errors really bothers me because content can be completely, context can be completely lost if there's lines that disappear. And it happens on television a lot, especially because for some reason, the captioning file can become corrupt and there's missing lines of dialogue. And why that's important is for example, I went to law school in Washington, DC. And I had a transcriber who was transcribing everything live on a laptop because I wanted to know exactly what the professor was saying. I didn't want someone to translate it for me. I wanted to know word for word what the professor was saying because this is the words that the professor chose to teach us. But my transcriber or most of them, how can I put it? They were not experienced transcribers. And they hired a lot of new transcribers and they assigned them to me. And I guess it may have been a budget issue back then. So what happened was, was once in a while, words would be completely missing. And so I'm in law school and 
there's legal theories being discussed and missing one word can change the meaning of the entire sentence and be a complete communication breakdown. And so sometimes I would bring these notes home and sometimes the information I received would be completely wrong and that was unacceptable. And so it's the same thing with captioning that becomes extremely important as far as news sources, news channels, uh, especially during the last election, there was so much misinformation that was spreading and so much information missing. And of course that's not good. And then during COVID, it was so important for people to have this information and having missing information is not good. And so, if, especially with live broadcasts, there tends to be even more errors and more missing information. And so, so I was thinking, you know, why would they have an interpreter? Why would they not have an interpreter on camera? So a lot of federal and state level announcements would have an interpreter on camera because the point is, is that these captions were just not reliable. Yeah, and actually um, before we hear from you, Jade, I, I, I do wanna um, um, point out like that that's really interesting that in some contexts, especially that live captioning, having an interpreter on hand is a super important um, counterbalance to more error prone captioning. Um, and we'll, we'll be talking more about that, about you know, situations in which both captioning and ASL uh, might be necessary. So thanks for, for raising that and let's make sure to return to that. Um, Jade, what, what about you? What, what do you uh, view quality captioning as? What are sort of the signs for you that something isn't good enough? Yeah, so I can speak to that. Sometimes if you're sitting at home, you're watching a movie and, they're, and as you're mentioning quality control and captioning, the quality of the captions, even when you're watching something you know, at home, if it's, if it's a person of color, if it's a person who is speaking Spanish or might be of a Latinx background, we often have our own slang we often have our own way to express things. Uh, for example, BASL, Black American Sign Language, that's a very important and valuable part of the Black deaf experience. So a lot of times that slang is not translated correctly, it's, it's lost. So I can watch, I can hear some things. So if I'm at home watching something in a quiet environment, I can hear what they're saying and I notice that the, the captions are not matched at all to what is being said. Sometimes it's even unintelligible. There's just a gibberish of words. If you're watching the caption, it's like, this isn't a real word. And then you're like, wait, what? What is this that they're saying? So that's the type of thing that um, we want to avoid. We want to be able to go in and, and fix that. Um, yeah, because that's being spread around and you wonder why there's information gaps in the deaf community. It's because of things like this. Yeah, that um, information gaps is a really interesting phrase. And, and then Delbert also said communication breakdown, um, you know, where captioning, especially when it comes to news and important information about health, et cetera, um, it's, it's vital for the captions to be error free. Um, so one of the things I wonder is if a lot of these um, just ca glaring captioning errors, um, whether they come from this you know, newly emerging tool of AI auto captioning. Um, and I just wanna kind of pose a question where you know, a lot of the times I think um, we as um, programmers and event organizers, um, you know, we're always thinking about budget and here Zoom has released this wonderful new automatic captioning uh, feature. Oh, it saves us so much money. Let's just use that. Um, and so I'd love to kind of hear your thoughts, your response to that question of like, can't we just use the audio captioning feature? Well, automatic captioning does not always work well. When you have a live human captioner, 
it, the accuracy skyrockets from audio, from the auto caption in terms of the information that they're disseminating, um, making sure that there's nothing missed, having a live human, you know, that's my thought, that's my experience at least. And I do have some strong opinions about auto captioning, of course. And I feel like auto captions can play some role, but it's a tool, not a solution. And that's a very important point to remember. Jade is it's, agreeing with that. It's important to use auto captions to identify these things, but it really takes a real person for quality control and makes sure that the use of words is exactly what is being spoken. And that's the function of a live captioner. And as far as a news channel, news channels tend to rely more on auto captioning, I've noticed because their captioning quality has just plummeted in the last few years. And it's extremely frustrating because there's so many things going on in the world and in our country and we need good and inf accurate information. And many times we're not getting it. And that's very frustrating. But I noticed an increase in problem, especially with local news, because they tend to rely on auto captioning. I've really noticed so many errors. And honestly, I can't even watch local news anymore because there's so many mistakes. And 24 hour news channels are the same quality of captioning, unfortunately. And so, with this abundance of errors, I've noticed they do a lot of uh, roll-ups, roll-up captioning. Mm -hmm. And there's a difference between that and pop-up captions that just pop up line for line. And so pop-up captioning is very common. And you see that that tends to match exactly what someone says. Right as they after they say it, the pop-up captioning pops up and, and has the exact line. News stations tend to have roll-up captionings for live settings. It's okay and it makes sense for a live setting because it moves so quickly and there's no time for perfection. But the problem is, is you lose the pacing. You lose the sense of timing. And in a news situation, it's okay because the conversation tends to be just talking heads, talking at each other. But some of those 24 hour news stations have a script, they're scripted. They're scripted programming. And so CNN is quite famous for their documentaries and they've done many fascinating subjects of their documentaries. And unfortunately I can't watch any of them because all of them use roll up captions and they lose the pacing and timing completely, especially in their documentaries related to comedy. It's so frustrating. And the timing in comedy is so important. And with roll-up captions, you see the jokes someone says 10 seconds ago. And I'm exaggerating, maybe. Maybe it's a few seconds beforehand, but I love comedy. And it's really hard for me to see timing and pacing just be completely lost with roll-up captions. So I feel like the FCC needs to rethink and reevaluate their regulations. And they need to stop allowing these news channels to all use roll-up captioning. And only for live settings should that be acceptable. And if it's scripted or pre-taped, then I feel very strongly they need to switch to pop-up captions because you wouldn't lose the timing and pacing that way. Right. Um, I, I just want to break in. We're actually having a request um, from um, one of our participants to have the interpreter voicing for Delbert to appear on screen uh, to help with lip reading. Um, so if, if uh, thank you, great, Justin. Um, thanks for, for uh, coming on screen. Um, I, I just wanted to say that that idea about the pacing and timing being super important for comprehension. Um, that's a very intriguing um, concept to me and I've noticed it, you know, with auto captioning, for instance, where, you know, it won't take into account long pauses in what someone is saying and then reveals, you know, so you pause and a little later that thought comes out that puts everything else into context. Jokes work like that, right? Um, and so the, um, the timing of it is ruined when it's, you know, roll on and everything 
that's coming up is already on screen and you miss that dramatic uh, timing. Um, so that's a really interesting variable to be aware of. Um, Jade, I saw that you had another thought that you wanted to contribute. Yes. Um, I did want to add to what Delbert was saying. I have noticed the difference between um, the platforms and their captioning capabilities. As far as Netflix goes, I've noticed that some of the movies on occasion, the caption comes in super fast um, or like it's not late, but it'll be kind of a lag and then it'll catch up and it'll go really fast. And then there's a lag and then it catches up and it goes really fast. And you're like, wait, I didn't even get to catch up with you. It, it, you're, you're on a certain pacing, but then that pacing gets um, destroyed because then all of a sudden they've moved ahead and they've shown you know, 10, 10 lines of dialogue in you know, a quick amount of time. So you're like, wait, that's not right. Why, why is it going so fast? What happened to the, the pace that we were at? You were at a pace and I was with you and now it's thrown off. Mm -hmm. I really noticed, I haven't noticed, that Netflix seems pretty good. I noticed it the other day I was having issues, Jade saying. Some other streamers are off and on. They're not very consistent, some of the other streamers. But one thing that I've noticed, especially on, is on social media and the videos that are posted on social media, all, all these social media platforms handle captioning differently. They're not consistent. And so it, it's always valuable to have a captioning file to upload onto Facebook or onto social media because often the captioning doesn't show up or vice versa. So that's one reason that I've been advising various folks. If you're doing promotional PSAs, commercials, or any type of promo videos on social media, I always recommend that you have hard captions burned in and then that's permanently attached to the file and don't trust the social media platforms to handle your captioning correctly. It's better to make it a permanent part of your videos on social media. And it's, there's a benefit for you as well because 80 to 90% of people who watch videos online, they watch without sound. And I don't know if, and this is not just deaf people, 80 to 90% of hearing people are watching social media videos and just power scrolling without sound. And so if you want to capture their eye line, you need to capture your content and you better have it built in permanently. Data saying, I agree. And I wanted to add a point to that. For Amazon, uh, their captioning, they kind of pick and you're allowed to pick and choose the color, the font, you can make it bigger, you can make it smaller. Whereas Netflix does not offer the variety of those features. And so that's, you know, there's pros and cons to each thing, but that's how Amazon does it. Okay. Um, so I'm um, wondering in terms of um, the different aspects of captions that you're, you're looking for, um, how, how does music figure in? Um, you know, one of the things that, that I've often seen is, um, you know, for any variety of pieces of music, I will see just in brackets, music playing. Um, and um, what is the, the depth of, of information that you want um, regarding music? You know, sometimes I'll see the name of the uh, song identified, the name an artist. Um, is that sufficient? Um, what, what are you looking for? Yeah, saying. Well, I don't even know where to start with this one. Um, for me, I am a music lover. I enjoy music immensely. And so I want to be in tune with what the music is trying to introduce. So for example, if you've got the music lyrics that are being captioned on screen, that helps me know what what the tone is that helps me go along with it. I'm able to, you know, follow the lyrics and say, okay, this is what they're listening to. This is the, the mood that they're going for. In the past, um, there has been a VMP, which is visual musical project. That VMP, this was years ago, mind you. 
um, it would appear on the ABC for the Academy Award shows and things like that. And that music, it would allow you to have the vibe, feel the vibrations of what the music sounded like. And that would give me an idea of what it was. Um, music videos that I'm able to, you know, see what the content is and apply it there. See how, if you make music more accessible, I think that's great. I think that's part of the whole project. If somebody's singing and I'm watching like a film or a video on TV and the person is singing and there's no captions there, I'm able to take in and see what they're doing, but I'm not able to follow what the vision of having, what was the purpose of including this? What is the vision of the producer, of the director? Why did they include this? If there's no lyrics, I'm not able to understand that. And so it makes it more difficult for me to follow the show, to follow the action. So if I'm able to have the lyrics, if I'm able to see and take that in with the scene, the visuals, it makes it more accessible for us as a deaf audience to really connect to really understand what's going on. It will help to raise awareness. It will help, you know, to feel like, hey, we're in partnership with what's going on. This music that's happening is not just, you know, something that is separate from the action. This is something that plays a role in the action. There's a reason that this has been included. But yeah, yeah I think if we're doing that, like on YouTube, on Facebook, there's a lot of music that has captions and sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not so good. Um, but there's no benefit to the deaf community to feel like we want to get involved, to feel like we want to participate in that if there are no captions offered. Yeah, and, and um, I, I know... Oh. Freeze again? My video freeze? I'm sorry, Jade, I think... Frozen for me. Okay, where I stop off? Okay. Uh, um, so as far as my campaign goes, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, everyone is like frozen. frozen. Okay, I'm gonna do my phone. Can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, I'm almost done. Um, the, goal, the goal was for the Fitzroy Music Project was to spread awareness, you know, uh, that we need music access, um, using deaf talent or hearing um, talent and group sign language to match their artist expression. Because if it's not accessible, you know, so we use um, sign language. And the goal was to, um, yeah, my idea was a was a, a big idea, and it was regarding to uh, creating the music fest so they could feel the music and uh, watch through sign and caption. But we wanted a live sing along, you know, so they can experience the music at the same as hearing people. You know, that was part of one of my campaign goals back then. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah I, yeah, I think I caught a lot of that. Um, I'm I'm super super interested in the the um, uh, idea of of just having the vibrations and the the this you know just the physical nature of music be part of the experience. Um, I'm also the 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 lyrics. Oh yes. I want to um. That movie, the vibration, mm -hmm. was an accident that I created for a movie that I did in 2001. And mm -hmm. nobody came up with it, you know. Really, it was uh, more of a, uh, an improvement. Another company already come up with, it was like a um, cushion where you sit on it, lay down, not, like a, a gaming chair. Yeah. Okay, so the vibrates and um, yes, wires. And then I order it for my movie, but it didn't arrive in time. So I was like, oh shit. I have a hundred people that show up for a, a shoot tomorrow. And, and I, I happened to have I had a friend who wore a, a fest. 
a silver metallic vest and I have a my boundary vest. So it's a short. So I cut out a hole. And I put a speaker in the hall and then a speaker wire. I kept it through the speaker and it works. So I have a prop for the movie, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's where the old idea came from, you know, music, you know, trying to uh, spread a lot of the music, making it accessible, and then come up with a music video. And this all ended up became bigger and bigger and bigger. But then later on, more and more people started to come up with it, you know. <laughs> I've never seen that on the web, you know. It's revolutionized. That's since, since I've been on ABC and my working adventure. <laughs> what was that last thing you said, Jade? I'm sorry. ABC American Adventure Show. I ABC American Adventure, American Adventure Show. show. Oh, okay. ABC American Adventure Show, where okay. millions of people saw me pitching to the five judges. Okay. <laughs> Um, I, I did want to return to something you said earlier, Jade, about the, the lyrics. Um, so um, the one thing I encountered looking at a, uh, peeking at a captioning guide for one of these caption houses is um, there's, they um, explained the music playing convention as um, a licensing issue that Transcribing the lyrics apparently was getting into copyright issues. And I'm curious whether um, that has come up in either of your work or advocacy around captions. And if there's any sort of counter argument to that, you know, I don't know if that's a pseudo legal argument, but what, um, what your response is to that? Delbert, I'm, I'm curious if, if you've thought about that or, or had um, responses to that. Well, I just said that fair use educational purpose, you know, that's what I do. I want to appear on uh, YouTube, actually YouTube, Facebook, and uh, that's what I said, and then they put it back on. Uh-huh. So in, on YouTube and Facebook, put it, make sure to include Add it. something to that? Yeah, yes. There was a lawsuit a while ago that was filed against film, film studios out there because many of them had stopped captioning song lyrics. But they lost the lawsuit for process reasons. But the point was, is that that lawsuit mentioned that some people, you know, their reason for not captioning the song lyrics was due to copyright issues, but there was no evidence of that. So they couldn't find anyone who actually made that argument. And so I've asked around many times in the past when I've had conversations about that and no one can give me evidence-based argu legal arguments as to why they can't caption song lyrics. Mm -hmm. And so now I feel like there was a lot of confusion on that topic and it became it became an urban legend Mm -hmm. And so it it became an urgent urban legend that spread as you know wildfire in the filmmaking community. And so you know it could be waived under fair use. And I can understand that some companies now are having that conversation with copyright office to try and come up with more clear uh, guidelines mm -hmm. as far as fair use. Um, whether that includes audio descriptions and captioning as well, because it should. Yeah. And it doesn't make sense from a producer's perspective. It doesn't make any sense to make that argument because if I get the rights to actually use the song in my film, I make sure that I get all of the rights and to be able to show that film on various platforms. And so if there's a big studio you know, that, and they may not accept what I'm pitching, you know, if I have less rights than what I paid for, it doesn't really make sense for distribution companies to make that argument. Because of course they have the rights to show the lyrics on, in captioning and screen because they paid for the rights for the song to put it in the movie in the first place. Yeah. 
And I'd also like to emphasize that a lot of deaf people love music, uh, just like Jade mentioned. And a lot of us enjoy music. So we really want to know what the song is, is, is talking about, what the lyrics are. And when they refuse to caption song lyrics, I feel like the person making that decision is insulting the musician. You're insulting the musician. You're insulting the songwriters because they chose the lyrics in their own songs for a reason. And there's emotional moments, there's moods, there's tone. And song lyrics often give valuable information. You know, they put you in that, in that scene, in that moment for a reason. So if you don't, if you're depriving folks of lyrics and you're depriving folks from the experience of enjoying that music because you lose something. Yeah, and um, one thing that um, you said made me think of like lyrics as part of the narrative, part of the storytelling. Um, and I think that goes for like the tone of the music as well, even if there are no lyrics. Um, Del, one of the things that um, I was so, made me so excited to have you on this um, conversation is the work that you did with, with me for the film uh, For the Left Hand, where it's a film about um, someone who at the age of, you know, in his late seventies is performing with an orchestra for the first time, a piano concerto for the left hand. Um, and there's uh, in the last act of the film, there's, there's a three minute section where all it is, is him performing. And um, I just would love to, to share screen real quick and, and show everyone, you know, these two alternatives um, to what that could have looked like in captioning. Um, so here I will share screen real quick. Where's my share screen? So here we go. Okay. So on the left is, um, you know, this same, the three minute stretch of music where there's no dialogue between, um, you know, uh, one hour, seven minutes and one hour, 10 minutes. Um, you know, so between someone saying not a big deal and then saying whew at the bottom, um, it's just music playing and applause. For three whole minutes, those could be the only captions. Um, on the right, there's basically um, the equivalent to lyrics, right? Where each beat of music is uh, verbalized as a caption that describes what's happening in the music. And um, Dell, as well as a, um, uh, a music critic helped us create these captions so that they told the story themselves. So here, you know, um, musical tension builds, bouncing between highs and lows, ascending chords from low to high, rapidly descending high notes, clamorous low notes, notes gliding upward to a climax, orchestra resumes majestic melody, sharp violin notes, booming timpani drum. I could go on, <laughs> um, but for three minutes, there's a whole lot happening dramatically in the film that without captions, will be completely lost and just reduced down to music playing. So um, I, yeah, so, so thank you Delbert for everything you did to help our team um, really understand the complexity of just how important music is to a deaf or hard of hearing audience. It is not irrelevant. Um, and Jade, I, I saw that you had a comment earlier that you wanted to make. And one thing that I did see in some uh, requests that are coming through uh, is for you to return to signing so that Rory um, can voice for you. Um, our, our cart captioner um, is having an easier time um, uh, captioning Rory. So, yeah. Yeah, if I remember to do so. <laughs> I sure, remember. yeah. Uh, so, okay, I don't even remember what I was, raising my hand about, uh, uh -huh. man. I think it was earlier with the rights and permissions. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so yeah, I did wanna go back and talk about that a little bit more and provide a bit more expansion on that. Sure. So when you're dealing with music, a lot of artists, 
uh, they can sometimes, oftentimes, don't have the rights to their own songs. They don't have rights to their own albums. They, they you know, become the property of the higher ups of the studio, the producer, uh, the music company, the music labels. So as you're trying to, I remember before I was trying to get in touch with um, an artist to get permission to use their song um, for the purpose of making everything accessible or spreading awareness for my campaign and trying to partner with that particular artist. So I reached out to them and it was quite a challenge and it was not easy at all. Um, so between YouTube, the captioning's not functioning that well, Facebook, things not being fully captioned. It, I had to fight, you know, I had to fight. Um, and that's why I set up Deaf Talent Media Corporation um, for that reason, because we, we see that there are issues, we see that there are the problems. And so we wanna find solutions for them and not, you know, just discuss the problems, but really kind of brainstorm and figure out how can we resolve. For example, how we can include lyrics and in our captions. And we have a long way to go. It's not a perfect process. So music is powerful. And so being able to include those lyrics, we want to be able to do that so that we can, you know, have more um, music, instead of it just being musical instrument, we want it to get more in depth with it as you've shown. So there's a lot of things that need to be changed, but it is a process and we're working on that. Okay. And not just in, in music, but in film too, working with sound engineers and wardrobe, it's, it's all a big process. Well, I think uh, the biggest takeaway take from this part of the conversation is if you are captioning your own work and you've obtained uh, rights to music, you can <laughs> caption those lyrics. Don't believe the urban legend. <laughs> um, it's okay. Um, great. Um, so another area that um, I know that, uh, you know, from what you've both already said that seems important to add to this conversation is the question of open captions or captions that are burnt in. Um, I'd love to kind of um, uh, hear from your, your, you your thoughts around, you know, um, issues, technical issues that might arise from closed captions or, or the ability for individual users to toggle on and off um, their, their captions or to sit in a theater with a personal device that shows captions versus open captions where everyone online or everyone in the theater sees the captions. Um, Talk to our participants a little bit about your, your thoughts about the benefits or drawbacks of either one of those approaches. Yeah, Delbert. And I mentioned a bit earlier, the benefits of open captioning being burned in or burned in captions on social media, because there's many people out there who watch online videos without sound. And there's many people that don't realize that so many hearing people out there and deaf people also enjoy watching videos with the sound off. And it's especially true during COVID. Then during the pandemic, many parents with small children were at home in lockdown and their kids were in, using Zoom for their, their classrooms. And so many times the sound had to be off when people were, were watching videos for whatever reason. Maybe they needed to be in a quiet room or maybe, maybe there was auditory processing disorder or the auditory processing or maybe English is their second language and English being their second language, they can benefit from captioning because they can understand English a bit better. And so now regarding movie theaters, They can help to, I can, it's helpful to understand the technology back then, uh, what we had in movie theaters, because in the past, the only captions that you could have were open captions, but that would require the captioning to be permanently attached or burned into the film print itself. 
And that means that there was a limited number of film prints with captions on them. And so they would send one to one city and then to other cities. And so that film could be seen maybe four, three or four months after it was actually released because they were mailing the same print to various cities to have showings. And then they came out with a captioning device that was on a stand with a reflective glass. And behind the theater from the projection room, they would have captioning on a, a large screen so that it would, the reflective glass would reflect the captions that were being projected from the back of the room. And that was an older technology. And then a newer technology was added. And do you mind showing the picture that I sent you of what it looks like? And this is a box that is attached to the cup holder. And so this is another one that shows one way the box is attached either to the cup holder and the other way is through glasses that the a viewer would actually wear. And the captioning would be displayed across the bottom of the glasses. Yes, this one here. So these are the two types of captioning devices. And it's a great technology that can that has some improvements, but of course they have their issues. There's many, many uh, points of failure with both of those, both of the consumer side and the projection side. And often many things can go wrong during this process. So the box itself runs on a battery. So sometimes the theater forgets to charge it or they may have set it up wrong. Or maybe the staff aren't trained appropriately in how these devices function. And the projectionist, maybe they have an equipment failure on their end or something is unplugged. And the result is, is even though that captioning technology is great because I can go to the movie theater and see a new release anytime, you know, during the time I choose to go during a preferred time of my, my own, but there's many limitations because of these technical problems and many deaf people, maybe Jade has experienced the same uh, that many other deaf people have, have described, but it's about a 50% failure rate. And deaf people mentioned that they have free, a stack of free vouchers from these movie theaters, because every time there's a failure with this equipment, they get a voucher to come back as an apology. And deaf people tend to have just dozens of these free vouchers to return to the theater. And the deaf community feels disrespected. They're not respected as audience members. They feel like they're being othered because their experience is different than the hearing audience members experience when they're watching the film. It's all, it's been a struggle. Many of them have left during the film because the caption stopped working 20 or 30 minutes in. And deaf people as movie going audience members have not been there. And now with open captioning, the deaf community, you know, and the deaf community is pushing for that because open captioning is far superior because everyone can watch the captioning together and everyone in the theater has the same experience at the same time. But the challenge with opening captions has been, it requires that they're in the permanent film print burned in. And so there was a limited number available in the past, but now we have digital cinema. So digital cinema is just a hit of a button to turn it on. And we don't have that problem anymore. So what is left is just convincing uh, the general public and convincing them to accept that as a permanent solution and a permanent feature in these films. And the problem with open, open captioning has been showing the show times aren't great. So they'll typically be in the middle of the week or during business hours. And so deaf people, you know, you have to be either unemployed 
or you have to be have a lot of free time or maybe you work the night shift and you can go to films in the day. So sometimes these films are one or two o'clock in the morning. Sometimes you can't go with your family or your kids during these times. And so it's really challenging to show open captioning during prime time when most people tend to go to the theaters. And so open captionings just should be more of an option at a more available times. Okay. Um and I know that some theaters are moving towards diversifying the uh, times of open caption screenings that, that you mentioned being a problem. Um, I know that I just saw AMC has announced they're going to be showing a wide variety of time, uh, you know, afternoon, morning, evening, weekend um, for open caption screening. So hopefully that is the beginning of, of um, uh, a greater awareness around the importance of open captions and the importance of them being at, um, you know, a nice diverse <laughs> um, timing slots. Um, I do know that we are- um, I would like to add this. something that- Yes, yes. It's please. very important that not only deaf people are aware of that, that open captioning is an option now. AMC theaters and Regal theaters are now offering more open caption screenings. We want hearing people to be aware of that too because it's there for them too. Hearing people, you know, can also benefit from having open captioning, but maybe they don't want to request it. And for me, it's just for deaf people uh, captioning, but hearing people can go to open caption films and it's for you too. And there's, there's been many comments that some films out there have very complex plots. Uh, like Dune, for example, a lot of people really struggled to understand what was going on in Dune. And many hearing people have said that I wish there was captioning on screen so I could follow the story better. And that this is hearing people making these comments. And so hearing people need to be aware that open captioning can benefit them too. Yeah, and I, I, can, um, I can attest that um, my wife and I now watch everything that we stream at home with captions on. Uh, and when we go see a, theater, a movie in the theater, all of a sudden our comprehension level has gone down because we can't catch the word that we didn't quite understand or that wasn't enunciated well, or you know, just was an unfamiliar name or um, with, with captions at home, we get it all. I'm horrible with remembering names and the speaker identification in captions is often helpful to me. Um, so um, I, I really hope that we see more open captions um, as well. Um, and I, I, I wanted to turn to some audience questions. Um, so I've been seeing some audience questions come in censor, um, centered around the question of, of censorship. Um, so one question is, can the captioner censor materials that are spoken live? There are TV shows and networks that block out certain words, but do not bleep them when spoken. Um, and there, there are a couple other questions around that in terms of you know, live captioning and what, what are sort of, um, what, what do you have to say about that question of censorship? And Jade, I, I, um, I'd be curious um, if you had thoughts or it looked like Delbert just, just did. Yeah, go ahead, Jade. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were focusing on the audience question. So I'm over here looking, where are the audience questions? I don't see them. And oh, you're, you read a question. So yes. I, you have to repeat that for me. Yes, I, I apologize, Jade. Yeah, I'm going to be kind of sorting through the questions that I've been seeing and then verbally explaining them. Um, and so one of the questions that I saw um, was about uh, censoring materials that are spoken live. Um, and just a question of, of what the guidelines around that are and what your own opinions around that are. So for example, if there's a swear word being said and then it's kind of uh, bleeped out on the caption, is that what you're meaning? Right, um, and this specific um, question asker said, there are TV shows and networks that block out certain words in the captions but do not bleep them when they're spoken aloud. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> That's a big issue for me, I hate that. Like, 
I'm an adult here. Hello. Um, my TV set uh, is set up for me. I don't have any children. Why are you blocking out a swear word or whatever the language is that's being used? Why are you omitting that information for me? So yeah, I have a problem with that. Um, yeah. I had that question asked to me very recently, and it's funny that you bring it up. So if there's a documentary where someone says the F word and should we caption that or not? And that a question like that comes up quite often. And so the captioning should be exactly what is said, period. If it's audibly heard, then you need to caption it. If they say F word, then you can caption the entire F word. And so some people get really upset if they feel like the captioner is trying to censor things for deaf people. And some of them are shocked. You know, it's infantilizing us. And it's very disrespectful and insulting. And I like to make a point that deaf people and ASL signers, there's over 50 different signs for the F word. <laughs> it's not like we're strangers to that word. Right, point taken. <laughs> um, okay, so another question that came in from an audience member is a question around international caption laws or guidelines. Um, so this, this questioner um, says, I am well versed in the US, but not international laws. So do either of you have any light to shed on you know, how captioning guidelines work in the UK or South Africa or wherever it might be? Yeah, Jane. Yes, um, just to clarify on that, I, um, I do remember there was a movie festival that I attended in, in another country. I believe it was France or perhaps it was Belgium, Japan. Yeah, they had requested my script in English and they wanted the time codes to be matched up with the script. So I sent them that information and the person was very, you know, well-versed in English and they were able to do the translation for the language that they needed for their country, which I believe it was Japan, uh, to make sure that everything lined up appropriately. They sent me a copy of it. And of course, I don't know Japanese, so that went over my head. It looked good. <laughs> and so turn, it turns out to be a really great experience. And they did an excellent job with doing my captions. I mean, that was, you know, I, that's happened for me with many festivals. Um, in my 25 years of experience that internationally, they often ask for me to send my script so they can do the captions. And uh, sometimes I have to do some work to make sure that the time codes are matched up before I send it out, but they always request and I always send it. Many different countries have their own, their own guidelines on how to approach captioning. So it's important to do some research and find out what the specific guidelines are for that country because every country tends to have that document documented somewhere. So it's important to do your investigative work and find that documentation that will give you the guidelines because sometimes they might have a different way of identifying speakers and they may have a different way of handling background noise. Do they use an italics or a different font color or there's quite a variation out there. And specific countries that your film is being shown in, you should check with them. But if you're unfamiliar with them, just make sure that you hire a captioning person who is perhaps from that country and knows what their requirements are. Great. All right. Well, I know that we are, oh, oh, sorry. Um, I know that we are approaching our next break. Um, so Delbert and Jade, thank you so much. We are gonna be inviting you back for the final Q&A after our next section, but um, I so appreciate all of your comments, ideas. Um, I learned a lot. So I hope our, our participants have as well. Um, so next up after break, we'll be speaking with our final guest. Um, Cheryl Green has pushed both herself and New Day Films 
the film cooperative in which she participates to adopt consistent captioning standards and workflows. Um, I'll be asking her about the challenges and lessons she's learned when striving to reach a wider audience. Um, and while you're breaking, um, again, we'll be returning at the top of the hour, so three o'clock central or wherever your time zone is. Um, think about any burning questions you might have about captions still um, and drop those into the Q&A. And I encourage you to ask questions that are specific to your organization and your own needs. Um, so if you are someone who has been tasked with captioning things at your organization and you're at a roadblock, um, ask a question that might help you pass that roadblock, um, whatever it, it be. Um, and so we will be returning in six minutes to meet and talk uh, in depth with Cheryl. Um, thank you so much. Uh, we'll see you back here soon. Okay. Welcome back, everyone. Um, for those of you who have uh, stuck around for this third hour, um, you are in for a treat. Um, our final conversation will be with Cheryl Green of New Day Films. Um, Cheryl creates high quality captions for independent films. I'm super interested to dig into the nitty gritty of how to transform an organization's approach to captions. Um, but first I, I wanna give Cheryl an opportunity to weigh in on the conversation we've had up until now. Um, so Cheryl, is there anything that struck a chord with you uh, with our conversation with Jade and Delbert that you'd like to add some insight to? Oh, mercy, Matt. I, I can't, I, <laughs> I'm kind of speechless. It was so phenomenal. I don't know how I'm going to follow Jade and Dell. Um, if I could add anything to it, it would just to be thank you so much for the insight and the candidness that you shared and um, for reinforcing what I love so much about this work. And Really, I mean, I was just pacing around my apartment the whole time, like, yes, ditto, ditto, ditto. So ditto, that's all I can say, ditto to everything they said. All right. Um, well, great, then, then let's, let's dig into um, uh, the challenge that, that has been posed this whole time, is, which is not just about captioning, but about quality captioning. Um, so a, a lot of your work, has involved fixing captions that have come from you know, low cost vendors. And I'm curious, you know, how do you evaluate captions when you see them and, and what standards have you developed for your own work? Yeah, I have two ways to evaluate. The first is as soon as I load one of these budget captions into my software, it will instantaneously tell me uh, how many errors there are of a certain kind. For instance, like Jade mentioned, they're too fast. And I have seen this on Netflix because my partner uses captions and it'll be like three seconds with no captions. Then all the sentences run by within one second. Ugh. So my software will instantaneously tell me how many errors there are with the reading speed, with how long they are. Some of these budget captioners have seven lines, you can only have two. I mean, maybe four, but really you can only have two lines. And I get these caption files that are up to seven lines long. So my first evaluation is counting those. Often it's several hundred. And I just personally call those illegal errors. The captions, I don't mean that in the, um, like they're against the law, I mean, they don't function for DVD or for broadcast straight up. There's just, if you sent those captions to PBS, your show would be rejected. Like you would not be aired on PBS with those. My second level of evaluation is the one that sometimes I have taken 12 to 16 hours to fix a caption file. And I'm like, why do I do this? Why don't I just throw it away and recaption the whole thing? It's faster. Oh. And that is going line by line, word by word, comma by comma, and fixing the typos. And I, um, what standards do I use? I mean, I start with a lot of the FCC standards, 
because that's what makes captions legal for broadcast. 32 characters per line, two lines, that kind of stuff. I fix that stuff. But then I also use my background in understanding linguistics and literacy development to format the lines and keep the reading speed so that they're really the most readable. But also, like you said at the beginning, Matt, the delivery has to be good. I can't put the punchline up before we get to the punchline. And if somebody is you know, gasping before they say something exciting, I need to put the gasp there and then put the word. So there's all those things, fixing the typos, fixing the music playing, <laughs> or worse, exotic music playing, fixing that stuff, making them culturally sensitive. Most of these budget captions do not identify the speakers. That is required by the FCC. So I don't know why they're not doing it. Um, yes. I think, yeah. I think that, did I answer? I think I answered. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you, one of the last thoughts you shared was about culturally sensitive captions. And I remember when I first spoke with you, um, that was something that really struck me and prompted me to think more about what that meant and, and to look for, um, you know, culturally insensitive moments that, that I'm like, now I'm primed to see that. So talk to us a little bit about that. Like, in what way can captions be culturally sensitive or not? Well, gosh, I mean, one example really goes to what Dell and Jade were talking about being um, adults who can tolerate the F word. So um, if somebody speaks it, you need to put it in the captions. Like that's the first way you do it. The second way is that the captioner needs to understand you are a human with a subjective experience and perspective, and you may not know something about a certain culture that you're captioning, so you need to research it. Mm -hmm. um, and you need to be careful. Like, for instance, you might see something like, um, for example, rap music being used with kind of aggressive terminology. And then classical music with all these very soft words. And I think we need to call that kind of thing into question and go back to what Dell and Jade were talking about. What is the director's intent? Why did you choose that music? How does that music push the story forward? And so I will listen to the music over and over and over and try to figure out what is the tone of this scene? Not what does this music make me feel? especially if I'm not familiar with that music. Uh, I need to be sensitive that I'm not using one kind of terminology for one kind of music or voice style and another terminology for other music. And then my favorite music example, my favorite music example to hate <laughs> comes from a, a colleague of mine who's um, Indian American. She went to India and filmed Indian people in India. And the budget captions, and we know who made these budget captions, put exotic music in the caption. Mm -hmm. It was, so not only is that just beyond obnoxious and so deeply ethnocentric, I mean, how white can you get. <laughs> it's like it was made in India and it was Indian music. What is exotic about it? Um, so you, you, your captions need to be sensitive to the audience as well as to the people in the film and the filmmakers. Just like my autistic friend who did not say crotch, she said crutch. Mm -hmm. She feels terrible about the representation people are getting about her. And this filmmaker felt insulted and felt terrible about how caption users were gonna see her film and think, oh my gosh, did she approve that? She did not. But like many filmmakers, she didn't know that she was empowered to demand that you fix these captions and make them accurate. So she paid me, I cleaned up the other several hundred errors <laughs> and I described the music that I heard. This song is upbeat, this song is more pensive. And she reviewed them 
and approved them before I sent her what I called the final file. So those are, those are a few examples. And, and that's something that I think is just so um, encouraging about working with you and, and you being a sort of solo captioner who does this out of passion and not profit. Um, so, but I wanted, what you have often is access to the filmmaker. Um, and I think that, that I'd love to get your thoughts about how that could be made more common. You know, what, what are the points in the filmmaking process that, that have broken down so that captioners don't ever seem to have access, in, except in rare cases, like when working with you? Uh, why, tell us about that, how that came to be and what you think the solutions for it are. Um, that, that problem of, just captioners not in doing their research, having no access to the filmmaker to get easy, quick answers. Oh, easy, quick answers. Oh, Matt. Um, <laughs> I mean, this goes back to special education. Do you want to know where this starts? This starts with segregated spe and special education. And this starts with um, deaf people sent to deaf schools or mainstreamed and not allowed to use ASL and deaf people and hearing people not being together. That's where this comes from. The problem is the filmmakers not, when filmmakers don't realize that their film is incomplete until they've added some access to it, whatever the access is. You can't ever be one film accessible to all possible audiences. But if you have started, you've budgeted your film, you've started filming, now you're editing and you still don't know about captions, that is a failure of culture in general. That is not the individual filmmaker's failure, but our culture and society at large for keeping people so segregated. We live in a highly sound focused and vision focused and audist and ableist society and filmmakers and producers don't realize that they should be considering this stuff from the very beginning. Usually what happens then is a distributor or a festival or PBS says you need captions by this date. Mm -hmm. And the filmmaker, what, what is that? Oh my gosh. Now they're panicked, now they're nervous and they don't know where to go to get the resources because we are so ableist and so into being separated in this society. Um, so that's why I, I was like, oh no, don't give, make me give a quick, easy solution. <laughs> the budget captioners, I don't know what their workflow is like. So I don't know how you improve the communication between the filmmakers and those budget captioners. But the big thing I see is all these filmmakers are like, hey, I'm gonna give you this transcript. It was made by, <laughs> um, whisper budget captioner's name. It was made by them. It had a bunch of errors, but it only took me about 10 minutes to fix it. So now you can make the captions. And I'm like, you paid for it? And then you fixed it? That doesn't make any sense to me. Like, is your editor gonna give you your film without the last scene done? And then like, I don't know, you edit the last scene. But people accept it because they don't realize that captions are part of the art. They are part of the news show. They are part of the video. They should be considered part of it. And often these filmmakers who are like, I corrected it. No, they didn't. I, I still got to correct it. And then I got to charge them. And now they're paying twice. Mm -hmm. So I don't know the quick and easy solution, but I would say that you know, Dell mentioned three play media. It's the number three play media. They're great. And I think they communicate with their filmmakers. I sometimes spend hours with my clients discussing the different word choices and timing and, um, and then maybe hours is a little too much. I, I got to cut back on that. But um, I don't know what you do with those big box budget mm -hmm. captioners. Maybe just don't use them. And, and just um, just to clarify the sort of the quick and easy solution I referred to was actually talking to the filmmaker um, and and, you know, getting the, the, the quick clarification that, oh, no, that that's not exotic music. That is 
you know, you know, insert culturally appropriate term here. <laughs> right. yeah. um, and, um, you know, that's something where you have worked with directly with filmmakers um, who bring their films uh, to New Day films. Um, and, you know, you talked about needing um, to change the culture of the, the whole field, you know, um, and I'm curious how you went about trying to advocate for and change the culture of New Day films in terms of making captioning um, a common standard there. Yeah. Um, in my work at New Day Films, because we are a cooperative, a 50 year cooperative, it's our 50th anniversary. Um, any single thing I do is built on the work of something somebody did before me. There are a lot of people who have been fighting hard for different pieces of accessibility, both in how New Day operates and in the work, the films that we distribute. Um, the first step that I took to do my part to try to change the culture was I started captioning everybody's trailers. I didn't finish. We as members invest in the co-op by doing labor. We're, we're filmmaker run. And so we allot X number of hours per year of work into the co-op. So I invented a job for myself. I will caption the trailers. And then I sent a very friendly note to each person. Hey, I captioned your trailer. Here's where to find instructions on how to put it on your YouTube. But I've already put it on New Day's, New Day's YouTube at no cost to you. And just started and just had a friendly little interaction. Um, I think I did maybe 200 trailers. I'm, I'm not finished. I'm out of time. I tore a ligament in my thumb. It's just, we're just trying to get there. Step by step. That was the first step. And then I did a much less polite, often screaming at some of the steering committee, we need an initiative. We need to make it a rule that every title is captioned. And so the co-op voted and we passed a rule that all new titles coming in have to have captions. Some of our older films were exempt. You know, stuff gets, that happens in a vote. You have to negotiate. But still, several of the older cla classics titles, their filmmakers have reached out to me. Oh, goodness, this is exciting. Would you, would you caption? I, I got to caption some of the original films that founded the co-op, even though they were exempt from the captioning mandate. The filmmakers said, this is too cool. I would love to have some beautiful captions. I want more people to enjoy my film. So kudos to those filmmakers. Um, we had a big push. A lot of films got captioned. I noticed they were done by <clears throat> a particular big box budget captioner. And so I recently, I'm on the steering committee. So now I'm empowered to make my own proposals. And I took PBS's captioning standards. I took Passion River Films. I think that's what they're called. Passion River, it's a distribution company. I took their standards put them together, saw what works best for New Day's politics and what we could manage. And I wrote a new set of standards for New Day and the co-op a few months ago voted in that from now on, all new films coming in cannot just have captions. They have to meet the specs that I put together so that they will be considered quality captions. And I have a spec sheet we're gonna put it on the website. Anyone can see the spec sheet. You don't even have to be a filmmaker. I don't think it's up there yet. I can't remember. Um, but the culture shift has, has to happen stepwise, comfortably. It has to fit in the budget and it's an attitude shift. So you can't yell at people and just say, be compliant or else what? Nobody wants that. So that's why I started with the trailers and then we built up to the films and we have a huge number, huge number of our films are captioned. Um, so when you, when you talked about, you know, I forget whether you referred to it as, as the steering committee or, or something else, but um, uh, what, what would you say helped you get buy-in for what began as your sort of personal project um, to, to do this just as your role in the co-op. 
Mm. Um, what 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 led you know others to buy into this? Would you say crying and using the f bomb? Part of my disability means that I have a really hard time kind of uh, filtering what I want to say if I'm real passionate about it. And so at our annual meetings, I would start crying, telling people we are a cooperative committed to social issues documentaries, and we are willfully providing some students one film and other students a different film. How can you say that you're working toward equity if you know that some of the students in this classroom cannot participate um, in say writing a paper or contribute in the class discussion on the film equitably because they watched a different film. The so, captions are so tragically I'll, terrible. I'll agree, but I'll ask around for you. Okay, no, my so, fuck, I don't even want to go. I think somebody needs to mute. Um, yeah, I think um, one of our ASR interpreters, Rory, I think you still have your, um, your volume on. Thank you, great. Sorry, Cheryl. No problem, thank you. Um, Um, well, so um, you were talking about um, uh, crying <laughs> and crying. really, yeah, really getting yeah. Um, just at these steering committee meetings, you get emotional about things you're really passionate about. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I made the case when I'm, I, I made the case to people, you, you are providing caption users a very inferior version of your film. It is incorrect and you're excluding people from participating with their fellow students if they are watching a film, if they're relying on captions and they're watching bad, inaccurate captions, how can they have an equitable educational experience? Mm -hmm. I also help them understand that there are some people who make quality captions, like there's a solution to this problem, pay for captions, and then, Endless kudos to Brenda Avilahana, who was our former equity and representation team lead. She and her team and a lot of people put together a launch fund. Mm. And any New Day member, new, excuse me, any new member coming into New Day, new filmmaker, can apply for this zero interest real slow payback loan. You need quality captions? Great. Here's a cash infusion. We don't want um, uh, the cost of launching your film in the educational distribution market to be a barrier. We don't want people to keep saying people with access issues. Nope, there's nobody with an access issue. The issue is when we don't provide access. So cost is a an access barrier for some people. So um, yeah. through our equity initiatives, we're trying to reduce that barrier for, especially for the new filmmakers. Yeah, I, um, you know, Ac Access Reframed um, is very much interested in this question of funding. Um, and so I'm just thrilled to hear about that cash infusion project and, um, you know, the work New Day Films is doing to actually support filmmakers who, um, once they hear about the equity reasons for captioning, they may be full on board, but they may be out of budget. Um, and so I am seeing a, a, a question come in actually live for you. Um, uh, someone really wants to ask you like, what are the expected caption rates? Um, and do the, you know, how much do those differ from quality captioning? Um, so yeah, let, let's, let's hear your thoughts on that question. My first thought, and you can quote me on this. If you find somebody who charges a dollar per minute, you need to move on. That like, that's kind of the only rule. Um, more, you should expect to pay between three and $10 per minute of video. So a 10 minute video should be 30 to $90 on average. Mm -hmm or 30 to it, whatever the math is. Now, a, a $10 captioner is not 
automatically better than a $5 captioner. I don't, uh, there are a lot of reasons that people have the rates they have, but it is just universal, 100% across the board that these dollar a minute captioners who somehow at that rate have an endless budget to advertise to me multiple times a day on Facebook, seven days a week. You should not trust them. They're paying so much for their advertising. Um, but yeah, so budget for, I would say three to $10 per minute and, and ask your captioner questions. I have people interview me before they hire me so that they can find out what is this process gonna look like? What am I getting for the amount I'm paying you? And uh, I guess if you find someone who charges $15 a minute, I'd probably move on from that. <laughs> Uh, that's I've heard of it, but I don't know who does that. That sounds unreasonable. And it sounds like um, a crucial part of that sort of interview process that you mentioned is, is there an opportunity to give feedback and request changes, right? That's going to be an important part of choosing a, a caption provider is how much do they work with you and, and, and you know, improve based on feedback. Right. Great. Um, one thing I'm curious about is, um, you know, I opened this uh, webinar with um, uh, some phrasing around um, not letting captions slip through the cracks. And I'm curious what you think, um, either at New Day Films or for really any filmmaker or any organization that is responsible for um, putting media online, what are the crucial checkpoints to ensure that captions aren't lost in the shuffle? You know that nothing gets uploaded to the web without captions. Like where, where in time does does that need to be thought about and, and planned for? I don't know the answer to that because I even recently had a client who we had tons of communication. Oh my goodness, she was just a dream to work with. So much communication, so many questions. Why did you say this in the caption for this reason? Oh, I don't like it. Change it to that. I mean, it was so much dialogue until the captions both met my standards and met her standards. And then she didn't put the trailer, she put the trailer on Facebook and didn't include the captions. I'm like, mm, I don't, mm, I don't know what to do. And I even mentioned it in the comments and I still didn't put the captions up. I really don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know where the pain points or the bottleneck points are. I do think they're different for every person and every organization. But if you have captions in the budget from the beginning, that should help. Okay. And yeah, I don't know what to say, Matt. I mean, I see people advertise their film screenings. I did their captions and I see them do these advertisements and they never list that they're screening their film with captions. I'm like, why did you pay me at all? What do you, why are you not screening it with the captions on? So there, there's a disconnect. I do see people say, I don't think there's any deaf people coming to my screening. And I mean, that's major face palm. Like, I'm sorry, you don't know who's coming to your screening. Also, it's not just deaf people who use captions. Also, give me a break. Stop forcing people to ask for access. If you paid for it, just provide it. And the people who want it don't have to make a stink. They can just have it because you already paid for it. So I, I, I haven't figured that one out. Yeah, and you know, actually hearing you, um, hearing you think that through, um, it occurred to me that I was super interested in the example you gave of the, the, the filmmaker who worked with you very closely to get the captions just right and then didn't post those captions to Facebook. Um, and my, my own guess might be that that person may not have been the one posting to Facebook, that it may have been the outreach team. And that's something that I've found in my own advocacy, trying to uh, encourage the people I work with um, to be more aware of captions is they, they may have that caption file in hand, but did it get communicated to their impact producer that anything, you know, if, if we, we wanna practice what we preach and we want to be accessible in every possible way, here's the caption file, here's how to do it. You know, that's one step that is often I think missing is, is just a general, um, 
you know, not only um, budgeting it for in the beginning, but also um, communicating to the whole team and getting everyone on the same page and everyone caring equally about making sure nothing falls through the cracks. Sure. Um, what's that been, what's that process been like for you at, at New Day Films in sort of rallying the troops, so to speak? Hard. Uh -huh. It's a big, big co-op mm -hmm. full of very busy people, all with incredibly important priorities and everybody's got a list of things they're asking of everybody else. So um, yeah, I think it probably follows the bell curve. You know, we've got some people who are like, I don't have time for that. Why are we doing this? And other people who are like, oh my gosh, will you caption eight of my films? Uh, they're not even in its distribution, but I just want them captioned. And we've got everything in between. Uh, yeah, and, and I will say that um, because I work independently, I'm my own boss, um, I don't, I, I, I use my time how I want. And I have decided that it is worth it to take unpaid time to walk people through the process. So I do customer service. Rather than ask some, wait for someone to go, how do you post captions on YouTube? I just tell them. Mm -hmm. I suspect it might be a barrier for you the first time you've worked with captions to know how to put them up. So why don't I just eliminate that barrier for you? It only takes me two minutes to paste in a link to the instructions to YouTube. I don't, I don't remember to do it every time, but that's kind of been my attitude. And because I work for myself, I have the freedom to use my time that way. And I do believe in when you know about a barrier for someone, if you can reduce it, just do that. It's just, don't wait for people to struggle and ask and and get a bad taste in their mouth around captions. Just here, here are the instructions. Let me know if you have questions. Yeah. So um, very much kind of thinking of your role as um, not just creating a product, but also educating your clients on how to use that project, product. Um, great. Well, so um, I'm actually kind of uh, tuning into some questions that are coming in specifically for you as we're talking. And here's a really good one, which is, um, what is the best route, i.e. cheapest, quickest, and most efficient, uh, to clean up auto captions on a video to readable ones? Mm -hmm. um, and, and this, I think, is, is from someone who probably is interested to, to do the captioning themselves, um, to capitalize on the auto captioning that's available, but then fix and clean them up. What, what would you recommend to them for the process that they should um, take on? First is, give yourself a pat on the back. I give you a thank you for that question. And especially because you didn't say high quality captions, you said readable. I really like that you set a super achievable goal. That is great. Go from captions to readable. So um, YouTube is amazing for that and it's free. The interface can take a minute to learn how to use, but once you've got it down, it's, I have found it's quite easy. I've talked to a lot of people who feel it's easy I and mean, you do have to feel comfortable with technology, but go, um, you can upload your video to YouTube privately or it's already there because you already have captions, but um, uh, you know, you can make your video private or unlisted and then go into their, it's called subtitle because really auto captions are not captions, they're subtitles. They don't have music and cats meowing and, and all the other speaker IDs, all that stuff. So you go into their subtitle editor and play the video and make them accurate, make them match. And um, the thing about auto captions is they have improved over the years. Um, they have their weak spots if there's music, if there's somebody with a speech disability, if there's somebody with an accent that the auto generating engine doesn't know very well, they're gonna be a mess. But even the best auto captions don't have punctuation. Mm. They don't have the speaker IDs. They are unreadable for a lot of people without the punctuation. So you've gotta go in there and get the capital letters and the punctuation tidy and that makes them extremely readable very quickly. Great. Um, 
so the opposite side of the coin is if, you know, let's say you don't want to caption, you know, improve auto captions yourself and do that work yourself, you want to pay a, a qualified and quality captioner. Um, I have a question, Cheryl, who are your caption mentors that are fellow professional captioners, um, not in media talent? Oh, mentors. Well, I mean, I feel like my captioning mentor is Sean Zdenek, uh, who, who's a captioning scholar. I don't actually know. I do, he's a professor, so I don't think he like earns his keep of making captions. <laughs> but I love his stuff. Uh, I have his book called Reading Sounds. It's just been incredible. I will say that um, I, I casually mentioned the torn ligament in my thumb, which is a massive nuisance. And uh, during that horrible injury time, which is still not over, um, I just referred almost all of my, almost everybody who emailed me, I just referred them to the company called ASL Captions. It's a deaf run captioning company. Some days I wake up and I'm like, I shouldn't caption at all. I just send everybody to them. So even though my thumb is somewhat functional now, I'm still referring people to ASL captions. I heard about them on Good Authority. Their website looks great. I've seen some of their caption work. Um, I mean, seriously, like I don't need anybody to hire me. Just go to that company. <laughs> <laughs> That's great to know that there are other companies around that um, meet your standards. Um, and then, um, you know, I do know that uh, another, our other panelist, Delbert Wetter, has um, also mentioned to me that book by Sean Zdenek. Um, and that's actually, um, I think, a, a great opportunity to um, bring our previous panelists back um, and start kind of um, having a, a wrap up conversation with remaining questions from the audience. Um, and uh, I'd love to start with that question of, you know, quality captions and Sean Zdenek's um, answers, which, um, you know, feel free to explain them. But basically, this idea of significance, how to decide when a, when a sound is significant enough to be captioned, and when a sound is not significant enough to be captioned. And, and I know that, that not captioning something may sound like censorship, um, but often there's layers upon layers of sound in a film. And it's a question of, you know, how to filter out the essential thing from all the noise. Um, so that's an open question to all our panelists, um, um, uh, whoever wishes to, to tackle it first. Yeah, this Delbert. is Delbert, I'd be happy to jump in. Great. So you mentioned that writer and he's one of my favorite authors. I encourage people to Google him because he has amazing demonstrations of creative captioning and some of his demonstrations, you know, are not everyday captioning situations, but it encourages us to think more creatively on how we can caption certain words on screen and use the information available for communication. So one example is a ghost. So the ghost speaks. And so you can make the captioning kind of look like smoke or wispy, the captioning font. And that's an interesting way to challenge us to think outside of the box. Because I think that that, it, that may inform future captioning processes and them improving. And so I don't, you know, it may not be for every TV or, or film, but it makes you think outside of the box, which is great. And there's one thing that he wrote that I actually use for my notes here. It's captioning is based on caring. Captioning is precious. And captioning space is also precious. And so if you put too many words on the screen, it can overwhelm the viewer and be distracting. 
it can be a problem for people who have English as their second language also, if there's too much to read. If I want to watch something, I don't want to be tired out by reading too much. So what about background sounds and background noises and occurrences? It's important if it has relevance to the story, to the plot, to the scene, if it carries the, narr the narration, you should include that. But if you caption every single sound you hear, whether it's loud or not, it's not always necessary. For example, if, if it's the pattering of rain in the background, if it's not relevant to the story, if it's not relevant to the tone, then maybe it's not necessary to caption it. Use your best judgment and use your captioning space wisely. Great. Any, any other thoughts around that sort of question of how to choose what to caption um, when, they're, when the choices may overlap and overwhelm? Um, how to zero in on that thing that, that matches the filmmaker's intent and that's important for the story? Um, Cheryl or Jade. I'm thinking Jade is saying, can you repeat that question for me? Um, yeah, so um, in, a, in a film's um, soundtrack, you know, there may be a lot of sounds that potentially could be captioned. Um, and how, what advice would you give a captioner for choosing which sounds to prioritize in the limited precious space that Delbert mentioned? Oh, I understand what you're saying. Okay, so um, I just wanted to make sure before I veered off course that I have a <laughs> question. Um, so it's called, um, so I have a, a family, I have a, a <laughs> I have a film um, that involves a hearing and a deaf family. And so, the actors playing basketball in a particular scene, they're shooting hoops and having a conversation simultaneously. There's also music playing in the background. Along with, you know, there's lyrics to the song and they're signing as they're going back and forth with each other. You can hear the sounds of the basketball on the court being bounced. And so in speaking with my captioner, we're trying to figure out what we're trying to express. What is the mood? What is the tone of that particular scene? What is the vibe? What's the point we're trying to get across? What, um, this is an urban type of environment. You know, I'm deaf, but I can still hear certain things. And sometimes I was able to determine, hey, this music isn't setting the right mood. Um, I don't necessarily have all the terms with it. I don't, you know, I'm not an expert with music. I am deaf. But back to the point is that we had the lyrics included, but they didn't let me know that they were going to do that. And so my interpreter was there. And so we have like the overlay of the lyrics. We have the sound of the basketball. We have the conversation with the voiceover. And we decided that was too much noise. It didn't work. And we needed to get rid of the lyrics of the music and just rely on the sound of the basketball. We had to do a little bit of tweaking to determine the priority um, because we didn't wanna have the sound of the lyrics being sung and the caption of the lyrics to take away from what was being said in the conversation. I did really want to include the lyrics. Um, deaf people love music sometimes. And so they want to know what is being said in a song just like a, a hearing person does. And so I decided that I would kind of, instead of having them overlaid, I would have the lyrics in yellow um, with, you know, this is the song that's being played. And then the conversation, the back and forth would be in a separate color. And so we kind of had to figure out where to position everything so that it was apparent to everyone that that's what we were doing. So it sounds like a lot, but it, it is a lot, right? That's, that's, that's fa a fascinating solution using color, position on screen, you know, all of the things that are available in open captioning uh, as tools to, to clarify and to aid with comprehension. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Exactly. Um, yeah. And, and if I can add on to that. Yeah. 
So in my film, we ended up winning 17 awards. And one of the awards was for best sound design. Best sound design, can you believe it? A deaf filmmaker winning best sound design. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, and I think you that want the goes... best sound design, hire a deaf filmmaker. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I really think that goes towards just how creative captioning can be, um, where it, it's really has the potential to become an art form, um, as opposed to a box that you check to comply with the FCC rules. Um, so I'm, I'm was super interested to hear about that, Jade. I'd, I'd love to actually see an excerpt of that to see how you went about solving that. Um, <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. Yep, I'll send it. Cool. I'll um, let you guys take a look at it. That'd be wonderful. Um, so one thing I want to do is turn to a, a few questions that I've seen um, that are older, but I, I thought that might be good for everyone to weigh in on. Um, one is around... Uh, the question of uh, legality. So are there any legal organizations that exclusively focus on caption cases? Um, so, you know, in terms of um, legal advocacy, legal cases pushing for greater access um, when it comes to captioning. Yeah, Delbert. First of all, the FCC has a process to report errors in captioning on television. And it used to be a very complicated process in the past where you had to inform the distributor of the network itself and you had to search and find the network email to send them this information. But now everything is just on one click. The FCC offers one specific form to fill out where you can send them information. And so if there's a captioning error, you can let them know, or if there's quality issues, you can inform them. So that's first of all, and it helps keep the compliance going as far as the FCC goes, because they will reevaluate their regulations and seeing if they need to improve them if they notice frequent issues. And so that will force them to put the time in to develop new regulations and become more strict about certain things. And so I hope that someday they'll introduce they'll, get, they'll introduce that as far as the roll-up captioning problem that I mentioned earlier. Yeah. And the other organization is the NAD, the National Association of the Deaf, and they have filed a multitude of lawsuits, and that's one of their strengths. And they have been doing that. So keep an eye on what the NAD is doing on relating to captioning regulations. They're very active and have done a great job in that respect. That's great. That's so good to hear about the um, process for bringing complaints to the FCC and, and the work that the NAD is doing. Um, that, that actually, uh, that opportunity to provide feedback in some way is something that um, connects to another question from our participants, which is, um, are there any Slack groups, or doesn't have to be Slack, just any online group in general um, for captions? And uh, I'll piggyback off that question. That's actually a question I have myself, because one thing I'm aware of is, um, you know, on Facebook, there's this really rich audio uh, description discussion group where people who write um, uh, narration for blind and low vision audiences, um, you know, can get feedback on their cat on their um, audio descriptions, and um, you know, um, audience members can can just share what was a really good audio described film or TV show. Um, is there any sort of equivalent to that for captions? Any groups that that really try to push forward captioning quality and uh, talk about it? Yeah, Delbert. I'm not aware of any organization or group that is discussing this. So if there is, someone please let me know because I would be happy to join. Oh yes, yeah, go ahead, Cheryl. I'm in that group, but it's I can't remember what the letters stand for. It's the CCAC. It's a Google group. Um, I feel like it's less active than it was a few years ago. I got digest every single day for a while. 
I mean, it's a, it, it's a cool group, but I just can't remember a closed caption advocacy. I don't know what the other C is. Yeah. Um, the, joining the group is C-C-A-X-S-L-C. Anyway, they're really, really neat uh, uh, engagement in that group. Cool. Um, I think that what we can do is connect with Cheryl afterwards and we can identify what that group is. And then we'll share that information with, uh, you know, registered participants, because um, I think that would be extremely helpful and useful um, just for anyone mm -hmm. who's interested in doing their own captions. And it looks like Cheryl found it. Um, yeah, C-C-A-X-S-L-C <laughs> at googlegroups.com. So I encourage anyone who's curious to snoop around on that. Can I also add something? Yes, please. I would also like to add that the work group that I'm involved with has been growing and more and more folks are joining and the group is still developing best practices for captioning in VR and XR applications. And so it's a new field and they're doing amazing work. And really it's the future of entertainment to make sure that our entertainment future in VR and XR is accessible. And that's where some of Sean, Sean's work, I believe, is really interesting because some of his ideas apply to VR in that VR space regarding captioning. Great, great. Yeah, and, and that's something that um, I think is absolutely fascinating, the idea of VR and XR. And, you know, one thing that I know that happens anytime there's a new, new uh, technology or a new medium out there, is that the FCC regulations lag behind for that new medium. So um, are, are you aware of, of, is the FCC thinking about virtual and um, I forget what XR stands for, but, um, um, and, and do, you, do you think there's uh, captioning uh, innovation happening in that space right now? I'm not sure if the FCC is involved with captioning regarding VR slash XR slash AR, different types of reality perspectives in that space. And so I sure, I'm sure their perspective is a bit different on it. I, think, I believe their focus is on television, television broadcasting specifically, and virtual reality, they tend to be hands off with, but maybe that will change in the future. Yeah, and I know, I know that like when Netflix and all the streaming um, platforms came, there was a question of whether the FCC would treat that as television. And, um, you know, uh, the prior standards and regulations applied to broadcast television. And then there were legal cases brought against Netflix to, to uh, you know, basically qual um, qualify it, or I'm not using the right term, as television. And then those FCC regulations for captioning applied to that. So that's that's what I was curious about um, with VR. But um, Jade, I, I saw you had a thought. Yeah, so I just wanted to say that the FCC needs to go ahead and get caught up. Um, VR and XR are in steadily changing and evolving and their technology is really top notch. And so the FCC needs to get be caught up with that. For myself, um, I like to, I'm familiar with CS, the customer. Um, consumer electronic society. It's kind of like um, a platform that is you a trade show. Thank you for new technology, new products, things that have uh, new innovation that's taken off. And so that includes VR and XR technology, all of that, um, streaming, everything that's involved with that. I think this is gonna be my fifth year going in January. So it's really exciting to see what's new and what's popping out in the technology world. And so, yeah, the FCC better go on ahead and catch up. Great, yeah, Delbert. I'd like to add that uh, VR is really interesting to deaf people because sign language is not in 2D. Sign language is three-dimensional. And so VR is three-dimensional. And so it's very interesting for signers. And it has, there's a lot of potential there for storytelling in sign language. 
with VR. And so I'm sure Jade and I, maybe we can work together on something like that someday. Sounds good. Come on, let's do it. So cool. Um, well, I know that we are just six minutes away from the end of this, um, this seminar. Um, I have just been thrilled with the conversation. So many, so many directions it could have gone and each one of these topics, um, you know, I think could be the subject of an article or a book. Um, so I'm, I'm thrilled. Thank you so much to all three of our panelists. Thank you to our ASL interpreters. Thank you to our CART provider. Um, I want to conclude um, by sharing two funding opportunities through Access Reframed. Um, that circles back to the original challenge um, of, you know, are you captioning and transcribing all your content? Um, so as part of Access Reframed's challenge to you, um, we have an actual opportunity to get compensated, uh, for you to get compensated for um, taking that first step and captioning your first piece of media if you haven't done so yet. Um, so um, one of my colleagues is sharing screen. Um, there is a QR code here, but we're also gonna put into the Q&A um, a link to the form. Um, I invite you to submit a captioned video um, by the end of this month for a chance to win a captioning micro grant for you or your organization. Um, so, you know, if you have a smartphone handy or, or just wanna um, open up that link, it'll take you to a Google form um, where you can share your captioning success story. Um, so you'll be asked to submit the URL of the captioned video as evidence. Um, and then we'll want you to explain how you were able to create the captions. You know, did you hire Cheryl? <laughs> did you hire ASL captioning? Did you do it yourself with YouTube correcting auto captions? Um, so explain how, and then we'd also want uh, to learn how you plan to commit to captioning in your line of work going forward. Um, so that is opportunity one of two. Um, and I'd like to turn the mic to my colleague, Jason Matsumoto, um, who is going to share some information about another exciting in, uh, opportunity for Chicago area film festivals. Jason. Thanks a lot, Matt. And thank you to all the panelists um, and to all the uh, ASL interpreters. Uh, thank you so much um, to Debbie, our uh, cart captioner. Um, I also want to thank the the audience members today. I just to, to be very transparent, there was a lot of really great um, suggestions offered to us throughout this entire time, and we just really appreciate. It. I think for us as a team, we know we can continue to improve and get better, and we're learning. And um, I just want to express how grateful I am for like the very candid and transparent feedback on the technical side of things as well as um, how to better improve on all this. I think it's something that, that we're very committed to as a team and we know we're not there perfectly yet, but we hope to continue to improve this stuff um, on you know, future presentations, so thank you. Um, I want to uh, announce um, a very exciting thing that we are working on as the Access Reframe team. It's a project that we're calling Empowering Action. And uh, the purpose of the project, as noted in the title, is to move really from discussions about increasing accessibility to empowering action that delivers increased accessibility. Um, this project is going to happen in 2022, and what we're doing is we're focusing on film festivals in Chicago. Um, through our prior work, you know, and as we've all talked about today, um, film festival management, venue operators, filmmakers, I think many people all have this desire to increase accessibility. Um, one, for audiences with disabilities, and two, for filmmakers with disabilities. Um, and then, you know, as the point was made all across the board today, those innovations have knock-on effects for every single person, whether they uh, do or do not have a disability. Time and time again, we've also heard that lack of financial resources is one of the major concerns and primary reasons that festivals, venues, filmmakers, do not achieve a greater degree of access. So we went out and we tried to find the funding to help at least one festival go through that process. So we have between ten dollars and $15,000 in cash. We are going to offer some consultation on implementation 
and an accessibility audit for one local film festival in the Chicagoland area. I know many people are calling in from different parts of the country. Um, this one, this is unfortunately only for folks in Chicago, but we hope to continue to expand this work, uh, you know, in into other regions of the U.S. The project's funded by the D case, which is Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events uh, in Chicago. And we hope to continue to raise funds so that we can increase that number of festivals from just a single festival to three or four festivals in 2022. The goals are very simple. First, we want to increase the number of film festivals in Chicago that offer accessible programming to people with disabilities through training, written resources, and festival-specific consultation, as well as direct cash assistance. Second, we want to build ongoing capacity within that particular festival so they can continue, not just in that first year, but uh, kind of commit to a, a long-term shift in what they offer. Third, we want to increase awareness of accessibility resources available to festivals. Um, and obviously today's caption workshop is part of that roadmap, right? And finally, we want to develop a replicable model for increased accessibility funding. So placing these foundations and funders so that like the filmmakers and the film festivals aren't kind of toggling back and forth about who should pay. There's a, there's a very key component. We can place funders and, and foundations right in the middle of that equation and hopefully convince them that, that that's a replicable model to help us get there. Um, if you are interested in hearing more about this program, um, as we continue to develop it, uh, or if you run a film festival that might that that you want us to consider, um, we're going to drop a link into the uh, to a Google registration form so that um, you can indicate that interest. So I want to pass it back to Matt just to kind of close everything up. I know Matt's been speaking a lot today, but I'm going to ask him to come back on screen and just kind of close it up for all of us. So thanks, Matt. Thank you, Jason. Um, and yeah, I'll just reiterate that um, and make sure that that has <clears throat> that URL to that Google form has been dropped into the Q&A for you. And again, um, all of the resources we've talked about, we're going to um, gather them together on um, the Access Reframed website. So if you missed anything or had trouble tracking everything in the Q&A, um, that's, uh, that's something we plan to do. So on the behalf of the Access Reframed team, and all of our wonderful panelists and accessibility providers, thank you everyone for attending today's se uh, session and making it through all three fascinating hours. Um, thank you everyone. This is Delbert, time goes so fast, it didn't feel like three hours. Yeah. <laughs> All right. yeah, thank sorry. you. Everyone. I'm sorry I did interrupt, but I do want to mention that many filmmakers really, they don't have an excuse. It doesn't really cost that much to do this. Um, if they're doing a promo or trailer, whatever it is, they can use so many different um, tools to add the captionings. They are able to hear many of them you know, are, have talking heads that they work with. You know, I work for myself, Dell works for, you know, himself. And so we have to struggle, get interpreters and have people listen for us and speak for us. So these people have no excuse. Um, make two or three different copies, two or three different versions, one without caption, one with the caption or, you know, whatever. And then one with, you know, the quality captions, whatever, and offer it to the film festival so that they have those opportunities to show that and that there can be a schedule created and there can be a system created for film festivals. So audiences who go and watch these screenings, they can pick for themselves if they wanna to go to something screen with captions or not. You know, I mean, it's so easy. It can be done. Yeah. They can do it. Thank you. Haggling back and forth and pointing fingers and who's gonna pay and I don't know how to do it. There's no reason to do that anymore. I've been doing this for 25 years, right Dell? There you go. That's right. Yeah. Get it. <laughs> so the funding is there. The cost has come down. And now it's it's about getting it on your awareness and making it a priority and planning for it. So thank you again. Um, we're all going to uh, turn off our videos as a, a clear signal to participants that uh, we're, we're wrapped for the day. But I uh, so appreciate everyone's involvement. Thank you.